Greetings, my name is Margaret Rung and I'm a professor of history at Roosevelt University and co-chair along with Professor Andrew Trees of the American Dream Reconsidered Conference. Before we get started on today's exciting panel, I have two brief announcements. Immediately following this panel, we will conduct a book plate signing with panelists Martha Jones, author of Vanguard, and Lisa Matterson, author of For the Freedom of Her Race. Thanks to the generosity of the Women's Leadership Council, the first 20 Roosevelt University students to email me at mrung, M-R-U-N-G, at roosevelt.edu from their university email account will receive a free book. Please include your mailing address in this email. Others may purchase the books on their own from stores or online, and we encourage you to support independent and Black-owned bookstores. Um, we will post this information in uh, the Facebook Live, YouTube, and LinkedIn sections during the panel. At 2.30 p.m., the Women's Leadership Council is moderating a post-panel discussion about champions for democracy, Black women, and the right to vote. Please find the Zoom link for this session at roosevelt.edu slash American Dream, or look for it in the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn during the broadcast. The Zoom link, as I mentioned, for the book signing will also be posted in those comment sections. Thanks and hope you enjoy today's session, Champions for Democracy, Black Women and the Right to Vote. President Ali Malekzadeh will now offer a few words of welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margie. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the virtual American Dream Reconsidered Conference. We are excited to continue our reconsideration of the American Dream with a panel that gives credit to the countless Black women in America who have and are still striving to make America a more perfect union. This year, the nation celebrates the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote. While we rightly mark that milestone, we should also make clear that Black women and men were unable to exercise that right until decades later. And even with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which significantly expanded the franchise, there are still far too many barriers to voting. In the last decade, decade we have seen countless efforts to undermine voting rights and a concerted effort to exclude people, often people of color, from casting their ballots. Our upcoming national election will likely be the most important election of our lifetime. Well, I think everyone deserves access to the vote, the most fundamental of democratic rights. Today's panel reminds us that some of the greatest champions of democracy in this country have been some of the people with the least amount of wealth and political power, black women. Their work then and now has kept the dream of democracy alive. So please join me in welcoming Associate Professor of History and Director of the Women's and Gender Studies Program at Roosevelt University, Dr. Sandra Frink. Professor Frink, who will serve as moderator, is a cultural historian specializing in the study of gender, race, ethnicity, and urban public space. Professor Frink will introduce our distinguished panelists. Thank you, President Ali, for that introduction. And hello, everyone. I want to thank you for attending our panel discussion, Champions for Democracy, Black Women and the Right to Vote. It is my pleasure to introduce the two scholars who are joining us today. First, I would like to welcome Dr. Lisa Matterson, an Associate Professor of History at the University of California at Davis and a specialist in US women's political history. 
She is currently completing a book about women's activism in the Puerto Rican independence movement entitled Within the Regime, Against the Regime, Ruth Reynolds and the Battle for Puerto Rico's Independence. Professor Matterson's first book, and the one we will be discussing today, analyzed Black women's local and national political battles against institutional racism. The book is entitled For the Freedom of Her Race, Black Women and Electoral Politics in Illinois, 1877 to 1932. I wanna make a special note that it provides a rich history of their involvement in Chicago politics. Hello, Professor Matterson. Hello, thank you for having me here. Sure. Second, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Martha Jones, the Society of Black Alumni, Presidential Professor, and Professor of History at the Johns Hopkins University. Professor Jones is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. She first explored these issues in her book, All Bound Up Together, The Woman Question in African American Public Culture, 1830 to 1900. She turned to the legal battle for citizenship rights in her award-winning book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. And Professor Jones' latest book, which is fresh off the press, reveals the inspiring stories of Black women who led the battle for political rights entitled Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. Welcome, Professor Jones. Thanks very much for having me, Sandra. Absolutely. I'm so excited to talk to you both today about such an important but often overlooked history. Uh, your books shine a light on efforts by Black women over the past 200 years to secure political rights for themselves and for their communities. And so often, the story of the women's rights movement begins in Seneca Falls in 1848. It then focuses on a few notable white women, their suffrage organizations, and their great success in passing the 19th Amendment. Your research, however, demands that we rethink this narrative and examine the experiences of those so often left out of it. So to begin, I was hoping each of you could tell us about the story you hoped to tell in your research and perhaps shed light on the challenges you faced in trying to uncover their stories. Um, Professor Matterson, would, it, would we be able to start with you? Wonderful, sure. Um, so in The Freedom for Her Race, um, I set out to tell the story of uh, how African-American women used the vote, used voting rights between the 1870s and the 1930s to create an activist federal government who would help uh, protect citizenship rights in their communities. Uh, so a little bit about the context of what's going on in the United States when they're doing this. Uh, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, at the same time that there's widespread disfranchisement, Southern um, white Southerners are disfranchising Black men, installing um, Jim Crow segregation, widespread uh, racial violence and lynching, some Black women were able to cast a ballot uh, even before the 19th Amendment. Um, and so what I look at is what did they do with this ballot? This is what I look at in the book. Um, the women who uh, were able to cast a ballot in places like Chicago, in Illinois, um, as early as the 1890s, women were voting in uh, some elections in Chicago. Uh, they, the state uh, enfranchised them to vote at the presidential level. So they were even voting in uh, presidential elections in 1916. Um, so they saw themselves as uh, proxy voters, uh, meaning that they were acutely aware that they held the right to cast a ballot. They were able to cast a ballot when the majority of African Americans uh, could not. And they took that responsibility very seriously. And they understood themselves to be casting a ballot for their communities in Chicago, but also for those who remained under um, the regime of Southern white supremacy. They um, 
many of them, those were, for many of them, it was their communities. They had recently, uh, this was the era that I'm talking about in the book of the great migration of Southern Blacks to the Midwest and the Northeast. And many of them had weathered disfranchisement battles, battles in the South. And so they went into Chicago politics. They brought with them a tremendous amount of uh, political knowledge and, um, and skill. And they made Chicago a center of Black political power by the early 20th century. They deliberately knew, did that, they knew what they were doing, and then they harnessed, they attempted to harness um, that power toward creating a government, creating a party system. I mean, a party system, if you think about it, is, is uh, really one of the most exclusive institutions historically. They attempted to push the federal government, local governments, and the party system to uphold the Reconstruction Amendments and the 19th Amendment in the South. Now, of course, the Reconstruction Amendments were those amendments, 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, the 14th Amendment uh, defining um, a citizenship as derived from and protected by the federal government and the 15th Amendment um, making it prohibiting the disfranchisement on the basis of uh, race or servitude. But the point, the point that I want to make here is that they really use uh, their ability to engage in party politics to try to uh, use every part of their access to the party system to push back against it, to make sure that they had a government that was going to represent them and their communities and enforce uh, the Reconstruction Amendments and the 19th Amendment in the South. And uh, I, I brought a, a image, or I've shared with you an image of the uh, book, and I just wanna, if it's possible to put it up quickly, um, I I chose this image uh, for the title of the book, uh, or for the cover of the book, very deliberately because it does represent exactly this ethos, this proxy voting, this idea of of using the ballot uh, to battle segregation. You see here Jim Crow, grandfather clause, and so you see this image of a woman. She's holding the federal constitution and she's protecting future uh, generations, and she's beating back the vultures of, of, of white supremacy uh, that uh, were affecting uh, uh, her community. Uh, so uh, it, this is something I can um, say a little bit more about during Q&A. Uh, the press took out a, a little piece of it of a man running away, which has its own kind of separate um, component to it. And I'm happy to go into it more detail, but that's the overall gist of what I, I tried to do uh, in, uh, for the freedom of her race. Yeah, and I know we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the individual stories in your books, but just to, to um, uh, note the proxy, uh, the, they're serving as proxies, you talk about a woman named Jenny Lawrence who came from North Carolina and brought with her her father's hope for um, political power and rights. Yes, that's exactly right. And um, Jenny Lawrence is somebody who has inspired me for years, and I followed her throughout the book. Um, uh, there's a lot I can say about Jenny Lawrence, um, but she's representative in many ways of uh, African American women who are not well known um, in the history of. Uh, voting and party politics. Uh, and so earlier you asked me a question about uh, about the challenges of telling this history. And one of the challenges that I encountered in this the period that I look at is, um, is archives. Archives are created uh, uh, primarily, they're organized around the stories of white Americans and white Americans with a degree of um, cultural capital uh, and uh, political power and economic power to be sure. So um, to recover a story of someone like Jenny Lawrence, uh, it for me, what was necessary to do was to go through the papers of white politicians. And so the, the, the papers of white politicians are, are well organized to tell the history of those white politicians. Um, but for example, and this is one way that you can see how she used her um, ability to cast a ballot and to canvas uh, to, uh, and when I say canvassing, I mean, um, you know, political meetings, 
negotiating with machine politicians, going door to door, even running as candidates. So um, she uh, was able to uh, get Oscar work in her canvassing work to get Oscar DePriest into Congress and to Ruth Hannah McCormick into Congress. These are federal positions. Uh, and so it wasn't just symbolic. Uh, and, and, and the symbolism is no small thing. It was symbolic. Women who had been formerly, uh, uh, who had relocated from the South. But, but these women are also, they're very they know exactly what they're doing in terms of their canvassing. They're trying to put people into the federal government uh, to uh, uh, to uh, make changes that will uphold the or push the government to uphold the Reconstruction Amendments and the uh, 19th Amendment in the South. So the point being is that to recover her story, I had to read through hundreds of boxes to find, a, you know, kind of a, a recreate my own archive, a small little a pile of her canvassing reports, um, of letters that women wrote to Ruth Ann McCormick. Uh, she was a white politician who uh, won a seat in Congress in 1928. And so there are these wonderful, wonderful archival sources at the Moreland Spingarn, at Howard University, um, at the uh, Schomburg uh, that are, uh, and the the kind of the history of archiving is a history about power and epistemology, epistemology and um, how stories get told. And so you have to, in some cases, read against the grain to find the people to recover the story and then kind of read against it to see what they're saying and that they're working within these um, white power structures. Right. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's such a great explanation. Professor Jones, you you also are talking about some women that are very well known, some women that are really not known at all, and only thanks to your book that we're hearing about them. And you start a little earlier too in the in the 1820s. So if you could uh, maybe share the story that you wanted to tell. Um, of course, thank you, um, Dr. Fink, and thank you um, to uh, the. Um, everybody at Roosevelt University for convening us and managing to convene us under these uh, extraordinary conditions. It's a special honor to be here with Lisa Matterson. Um, and I think you can hear in her presentation um, why I so admire her um, both as a thinker and as a researcher, because the work she describes rather um, blithely is really arduous and, um, and we really have all benefited from it um, so importantly. Um, Vanguard is a book that looks at 200 years of African-American women's uh, political thought, uh, political activism, um, with a focus on the struggle for voting rights, including the road to the 19th Amendment. Um, you sort of allude to one of the um, things that happen when you ask a question about voting rights of African-American women is that the timeline um, that might be familiar to us gets disrupted. We start before uh, 1848 in that meeting in Seneca Falls, New York with uh, a small group of women and some men. Um, and we come forward beyond the 19th Amendment all the way until the modern civil rights era and the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. So um, already, I hope you can begin to hear the ways in which when we introduce uh, completely and fully black women into political history, we tell a different kind of story. Um, this is no secret that we're in an anniversary year for the 19th Amendment. Um, and uh, this conference does such important work in helping us, I think, to dispel some of the myths that surround the 19th Amendment. Um, the first being that um, American women, all American women won the vote um, in 1920. Um, while the 19th Amendment prohibited the states from uh, using sex as a criteria for voting rights, there were many ways in which American women um, continued to be kept from the polls by age requirements, by mental competency requirements, citizenship and residency requirements. There were American women in 1920 who lost their citizenship or denaturalized when they married non-citizens. Um, but in the story of Vanguard, I focus on 
um, African American women who now, if you will, become equal, many of them, particularly in the American South, equal to their husbands and their sons, their fathers, um, who have, as Lisa Matterson suggested, already experienced disenfranchisement in the face of literacy tests and poll taxes, uh, whites only primaries, and intimidation and violence. Um, so Vanguard turns very much on this moment when um, some American women, including black American women, will indeed get to the polls for the very first time in 1920. Um, they will, many of them already been voting, as is the case in Illinois, um, even before a federal amendment. Um, but it is also the case that for African American women, um, 1920 marks not the end of a movement for voting rights, uh, but the beginning of a movement for voting rights that black women will wage um, alongside black men and take us to the modern civil rights era. Um, if I could share just a tiny vignette to illustrate um, one of how this is a turning point in Vanguard. Um, I'll say that um, African-American women are organized um, through many sorts of associations, including the National Association of Colored Women in 1920. And that organization thinks hard about how to come forward out of a disappointment or the disappointments of the 19th Amendment. Um, and they fix on the notion that they should now work for federal legislation that would give teeth to the 19th Amendment and would, in essence, override the state laws that threaten to keep Black women from the polls. Hallie Quinn Brown, a name that is not a household name, at least not yet, but um, someone uh, who I get to um, introduce to broad readers in Vanguard. Hallie Quinn Brown is the president of the National Association of Colored Women. And she develops this strategy and then goes ahead to uh, approach Alice Paul, who by this time is a national figure of great reputation, the head of the National Women's Party, and strongly associated with some of the most radical uh, strategies and tactics that uh, lead to the 19th Amendment, um, Hallie Quinn Brown goes to Alice Paul and asks her if she and the National Women's Party won't stay in the fight for women's voting rights and now partner with Black women to win federal legislation. Brown calls upon Alice Paul and with a formal delegation, um, makes a proposal. And what we know is that in the wake of that in treaty, um, Alice Paul will decline and the National Women's Party will fold and uh, Alice Paul will move on, um, importantly, to propose a new federal amendment, an equal rights amendment, an amendment that still is with us today, not yet ratified. Um, but it tells us something about um, the distance and the tensions in terms of political agenda between black and white women in 1920 and sets us up to understand why now Hallie Quinn Brown and her National Association of Colored Women will um, come to associate with um, civil rights organizations like the NAACP and embark on what is a new and a fresh chapter in the history of American voting rights. Um, the last bit I'll say is that I really wrote Vanguard um, because I wanted us in the 21st century to um, be well equipped to understand the uh, tremendously influential African American women who are part of our own political moment. And I confess that um, when I heard uh, Senator Kamala Harris give her um, acceptance speech at the uh, Democratic National Convention, and she name-checked women like Mary Church Terrell and Shirley Chisholm, Constance Baker Martley, um, uh, Ida B. Wells, um, women who I chronicle in Vanguard and some of whom also make an appearance in Lisa Matterson's book, um, I felt very affirmed in, in, um, in the sense that um, this history that we tell um, has a life in the 21st century, um, and I hope will help us all think um, more astutely, more critically, and more insightfully about um, the uh, contest that is upon us uh, this fall. So thanks again, um, I really appreciate the chance to be here. Oh, sure, absolutely. And uh, we have so much to learn from these women as well. And so I'd, I'd like to focus a little bit up about 
on their ideals and their and their strategies. Uh, Professor Jones, you state that black women um, dreamed big, quote, dreamed big about women's rights and, and aimed high, committed to using their power to win the dignity of all people. And uh, your book highlights this ethos of mutuality that shaped their fight for rights, a uh, belief that this was not just a battle for the right of individuals to vote, but a means of lifting all humanity. Could you explain that a little bit more and maybe provide an example? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I knew about um, African American women's political thought um, in the 20th century um, was um, the important degree to which Black women had really um, championed um, both, if you will, feminism and anti racism as companion, intersecting, um, inextricably uh, tied together interests as exemplified in the lives of black women themselves. So one of my questions was, um, where did that idea begin? Um, and I, like historians do, begin to pull a thread that has one end in the 1980s and I find myself at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and when I get there, I discover um, some remarkable early women, black women preachers, political activists, um, literary association leaders who um, are already developing a critique and a politics um, out of this denigration um, that is the companion denigrations of racism and sexism. It turns out that ideas that we think are very 21st century sounding are old ones. And um, in that though, and I think this is your point, in that is an important piece and a word I didn't expect to find so frequently deployed, which was the term humanity. Um, that here black women strive for, for political power, develop political thought, engage in activism, always with an eye toward, if you will, all of us. Um, what is a democracy? What are human rights? Um, what is equality? What is dignity? Um, and these are principles, these are frameworks that black women very much understand aren't unique, uh, uniquely germane to their lives at all, um, but actually are um, ideals, um, some of the foundational and the best ideals um, of um, Americans. Um, I call them the vanguard because a very, for a very long time, they are quite alone in holding up those ideals, um, but they carry them forward in time um, all the way until our own time, um, such that we have the opportunity as I, to catch up <laughs> and and to um, and to really make good on what those ideals should mean even in the 21st century. Right, right. Professor Matterson, you also described this ethos of mutuality and this long struggle. And you focus on the sophisticated political strategies that black women developed to mobilize and to influence electoral politics locally and nationally. And in doing so, you show how they reshaped the Republican Party in the early 1900s. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to their political savvy and their ability to, to mobilize and organize. Sure, I, I would be happy to. Um, and I'd, I, I can't emphasize enough um, how savvy they were, how sophisticated they were in the strategies that they developed. Uh, and that is because, as um, Professor Martha Jones was saying, they face an incredible amount of sexism and racism uh, in trying to conduct this work. So in the party system, um, these were not friendly sites. So they were operating in sites at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries that were not particularly welcoming to them. And so if they if they wanted to get the issues that they thought were important into an election, if they wanted to get the candidates that they wanted in an election, it required um, a significant strategy. And so there are many that I could tell you, but in the uh, um, because of time, let me just emphasize a few. Um, one of the ones that I found fascinating when I was 
doing my research, and I ran into it over and over again, uh, was that they, in essence, made every election that they were involved with a referendum on the Reconstruction Amendments and on the 19th Amendment. It didn't matter if it was a small local election or a, a federal election, a presidential election. In other words, um, if, it, if it was an election about um, uh, uh, education or school boards, uh, as was the case in the 1890s, 1894 was the first election that women could vote in Chicago. Uh, and they did uh, in their canvassing work and the speeches they made, including Ida B. Wells and um, many other women whose names are, are less well known, um, they would talk about the importance of education to their communities. But they also in their speeches would talk about how um, the federal government was not enforcing the 15th Amendment in the South. They talked about violations of the 14th Amendment and it was incredibly striking. And so in other words, where there was no space for this conversation in other venues, they got the issues they wanted into the election. And to take another example from a national election, from a federal election that, that shows some of the ways that they did this, um, the example I want to share with you is the 1928 uh, presidential election. This was the election between Al Smith, Democrat, and um, Herbert Hoover, a Republican. And the majority of, of African American uh, women who could vote uh, did so, or they favored the Republican Party. Uh, one thing that I neglected to mention um, earlier is that for many 21st century years, it sounds unusual to talk about uh, this um, uh, uh, large uh, commitment to the Republican Party among African American voters. Uh, and this was um, the majority of African American voters uh, voted on behalf of the Republican Party, the party of anti-slavery, the party of the Reconstruction Amendments, uh, all the way up until uh, the mid to mid 1930s. I mean, there were folks who certainly remained Republican afterward, uh, but then there's a large uh, voting realignment, uh, and then there's a switch of the majority of voters to the Democratic Party. So, with that aside, uh, so what? Uh, what was on the ballot in 1928 was uh, whether the country should repeal the 18th Amendment, which is the uh, Prohibition Amendment against liquor. And uh, women in Chicago and nationally, the women in Chicago, by the way, were networked in these organizations that um, Martha Jones was talking about, the National Association of Colored Women, um, the National League for Republican Colored Women. Uh, and they, uh, they said, look, this country has never repealed an amendment before. And this is a very dangerous precedent because there are amendments already on the books that are not being enforced, which was part of the argument about repealing the 18th Amendment, and that are among white Southerners unpopular. And so in other words, what they did here is that they they shifted the conversation and they said, uh, look, if if they talking about prohibition. Now the conversation in this election is about the Reconstruction Amendments, the Nineteenth Amendment, their, their the the potential power of those amendments and the fact that they weren't weren't being enforced. And I'd like to say one other strategy. Their strategies are so so interesting to me, and I think they really are a shining light for. Um, political strategists in this contemporary moment. I mean, they really found a, a wedge uh, where they could assert leverage uh, and they, they, uh, they uh, capitalized on it. So um, all these organizations, um, uh, Martha Jones was talking about uh, the, the churches, also the reform groups at the local and the national level, they had the ability to get out the vote. They were heavy canvassers, and so what they would do is they would purposely go to candidates they wanted in a campaign before the primaries because 
what they argued was that once uh, once the primary was over, then white party functionaries were in charge of kind of, or had more leverage. And so they worked before the primaries and they would go to candidates and they say, look, if you uh, will run for the primary, we want you to run for these reasons. We, uh, we um, support your platform, so on and so forth. We'll help you win. And so this is one of the ways that they work to get candidates uh, that they want at the local and at the federal level. And they were they were savvy negotiators. Of course, the story of um, Ida B. Wells Burnett and the way that she uh, negotiated with the second ward regular Republican machine in 1914 to uh, make sure that um, Oscar de Priest was um, the candidate uh, uh, and then eventually became the first black alderman in Chicago and then went on to become the first black congressman since 1901. Um, that is entirely from the savvy negotiation and the threat of withholding the possibility of, um, uh, of uh, canvassing. Wow. Um, you know, and I'm so glad you noted that they recognized how tenuous their rights were, that they had to be ever vigilant um, about, the possible repeal of these reconstruction amendments. Um, I think it's a good lesson for us today as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you for those examples. So in the course of our conversation, you have both men mentioned individual women, which leads me to my next question, because your books illuminate the stories of inspirational women, uh, some famous, some whose histories have been little known until now. And so I, wanted to give you both the opportunity to share one or two of their stories um, and their experiences, maybe what we can learn from their experiences. And Professor Jones, I, if you want to take this opportunity to explain to us who Nancy Bell Graves is, that would be wonderful too. I know you've dedicated your book to her. So if we would, we can start with you if you'd like. Thank you. Um, I will end if, with Nancy Bell Graves, but let me come back to Hallie Quinn Brown because I think her uh, life story actually um, exemplifies what um, Black women's politics um, could look like, did look like um, over a long arc. Um, Hallie Quinn Brown is born before the Civil War. Um, she's part of a family that migrates to Canada um, out of a kind of despair um, that both slavery and uh, the end of slavery and the advent of civil rights is never going to come in the United States. But after the war, um, after those Reconstruction era uh, amendments and um, in the heyday of Reconstruction politics that experiment in interracial democracy, she comes back to the US. Um, she's educated at Wilberforce University in Ohio. Um, she uh, becomes an educator. Um, which is a very, um, very typical trajectory for activist women. This is a um, vocation for which um, they um, win training um, and then they support themselves. So she's an educator both at the high school level and at the college level, um, eventually accepts a post at her uh, alma mater, Wilberforce. Um, she's also a, a Christian activist, um, a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and that is really where she begins her career in politics. Um, in the 1880s, she runs to head the um, Board of Education within the AME Church, and it causes a bit of a stir um, because within that denomination, as within many Protestant denominations at the end of the 19th century, there is a live debate about women's authority, how much authority should women have, should they be ordained to the ministry, should they be able to elect bishops and ministers, should they be elected to formal office. And Hallie Quinn Brown generates a, a real debate about the rights of women within her church, and it is um, that debate that she will then carry um, into the National Association of Colored Women, where by the beginning of the 20th century, she is now going to head their suffrage department. Um, and so the NACW um, includes a strong um, 
component of uh, voting rights work, um, but as important in that organization is for, are, for example, um, the struggles around uh, winning federal anti-lynching legislation. Black women like Hallie Coon Brown never find a um, very compatible home in women's suffrage associations. Um, their politics are too broad. Um, their um, their uh, resistance to anti-Black racism is too um, upfront. Um, and still, she will be um, as staunch a suffragist um, as any you might find at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I've mentioned that she's head of the NACW and really does steer that organization into the years after the 19th Amendment. Um, and then she goes on to do one more thing that I um, find not only fascinating, this is the way I first uh, encountered her, is that in 1926 she publishes a book called Home One Homespun Heroines and Other Women of Distinction. Now that might sound like a a lightweight title, but don't be misled. Um, what Hallie Quinn Brown is doing by collecting the biographies of dozens and dozens of black women um, going back to those who had been enslaved and formerly enslaved and coming all the way up to um, the first decades of the 20th century, including black suffragists, she collects these biographies as a way of making the case that black women are not only um, prepared, they are equipped, they are adept at citizenship um, and are among those who um, federal legislation should guarantee um, the right to vote. Um, so she, um, I hope you can hear in the quick rendition of her activist life, um, the ways in which Hallie Quinn Brown is working um, in many facets of politics, finds politics in church, um, exports that, if you will, um, to civil society, um, and then works both as an organizer, um, as an educator, um, and as a writer, um, all um, always returning to the question of Black women, um, their political standing, and their political power. Wow. And, and an archivist too, right? Because she then documents this history for us. Absolutely. And in fact, her um, homespun heroines is um, reissued um, by uh, New York City's um, public library, um, the Schomburg Center, the African American uh, Research Center as part of New York Public Library. Um, and so it comes back right, to us as historians um, and um, we have made um, really good use out of it, I can tell you. Um, so I will say just briefly, um, Vanguard is dedicated to Nancy Bell Graves, who is my great, great, great grandmother, three times uh, great grandmother, um, dedicated to her in part because I'm sitting at home in my office. This is one of the quirks of uh, Zoom life is that we're we're here together and but I'm looking at her portrait because it hangs on my wall here, um, and her story and the story of her daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters um, are very much run through Vanguard in the sense that um, I really wanted this book to take the lead from. Um, the lived experiences as well as the lives and the activism of black women. And Nancy Bell Graves was born enslaved um, in the first years of the 19th century in Danville, Kentucky. Um, and while she doesn't live long enough um, to see the 19th Amendment, um, her daughter and granddaughter and great-granddaughter all do. Um, and so I begin the book with their story um, about how as the descendants of enslaved people, um, black women come uniquely um, to the contest around voting rights and work to insert their interests, um, their concerns, their perspective um, into that debate, sometimes successfully, sometimes um, less so, um, but always um, with this set of ideals um, that we talked about earlier um, up front. Right, absolutely. Professor Madison, would you like to share one or two stories from your book? Uh, yes, um, I think um, there's so many stories. What I'll do is I'll extend the conversation that I had started to talk about 
Jenny Lawrence uh, at the beginning of um, our time together. Uh, we I talked briefly about she was a um, a major canvasser in the predominantly black wards of South Chicago. She was originally from North Carolina. She relocated to Chicago as part of the Great Migration in 1912. And I think um, I mentioned earlier that she uh, understood the work that she was doing uh, in Chicago. The political work she was doing is that she was doing it as an extension of the activism that her parents had performed um, or had undertaken to um, acquire uh, political rights, political equality, political power during Reconstruction uh, after the Civil War. And um, her parents, it, it was one, finding her parents was a um, getting a little bit kind of behind the hood of 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 what goes on in um in research uh her story i think has uh, been so important to me because it was a real turning point in my understanding of um, the type of political knowledge and know-how that women carried with them from well before when they were themselves um, political activists um I, she and um in different places, I saw that she had mentioned that she, her father was a political activist, and there are um, no continuous runs of uh, black newspapers in North Carolina. So I thought it would, I didn't think it was going to be very possible to find information about her parents, but a colleague of mine said, well, just go start looking through some of the uh, white newspapers and maybe you'll find something. So I did, I started looking through the Charlotte Observer uh, and I couldn't believe it. Um, there was her father uh, giving a speech at Biddle Memorial University in, outside Charlotte in 1876. This is uh, He was doing so as a uh, person who was about to be a delegate at the, um, the North Carolina um, Republican convention, county convention, and he um, was in a last ditch effort to prevent the uh, reassertion in government in North Carolina of the exact same white men who had led North Carolina prior to the Civil War or during the Civil War. And so my point is that it was a real turning point for me in my research and making the connection, this kind of the Southern um, uh, hybrid political knowledge that women operated with uh, when I saw the degree to which uh, her father was involved. And so when she uh, brings up uh, the title of my book is, is her words for the freedom of her race. That's how she described her canvassing work and the canvassing work of the women with whom she worked um, first in the second ward, then in the third ward. Um, she talked about canvassing as something that she saw women doing for the, or a woman doing for the freedom of her race. Uh, and so you can see that I um, was so uh, inspired and moved by her story and her words that I used um, them to title the book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, both of you are just, really demonstrating how important it is for us to look at these issues historically, and that there is this long history of struggle and that um, these women certainly recognized it, um, looked to their ancestors and their families and this past. Uh, you know, my last question was gonna bring us up to the present and kind of think about the lessons that uh, these, the, the guide that these women can provide to us. Um, I also have a, a number of questions from some people in the audience. So I'm gonna combine the two, all right? I'm gonna start with the questions and maybe we can get to this contemporary moment and, and the lessons learned. Uh, so I, I have a question from Julius Rhodes. Can you share your feelings about how Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are historically portrayed given their objections to the rights of blacks and in particular black women to vote? Well, um, I'll, 
I am grateful to for the uh, work of Lisa Tetro. And um, if it's a, a book that you or work that you have not encountered, uh, she has helped us understand the ways that they uh, were involved in I, I talked about the, the way the way that archives are an extension of a certain degree of or a large degree of power. And so um, we understand that uh, when people who are in positions of authority or power are in a position also to write that history, um, we're in a in a place now where we're re revisiting or revising um, thanks to the work of uh, historians like uh, Lisa Tetro and Martha Jones and others who are um, uh, leading in to their, um, the racism that was um, central to the organizations that they ran, uh, the National Association or the NASA, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, as Martha Jones mentioned, was not a welcoming site, to say the least, for women of color. Uh, and so um, what we see is that African-American women are taking to task uh, these women while also er working within organizations that are unfriendly. So as as far as the feelings, I'm, uh, uh, I, as a historian, I skirt around uh, the feelings, but the, uh, um, this is a, a new moment. And one of the, one of the outcomes, I think of the 19th amendment, and of course, also the work of um, Kathleen Cahill, who's um, shining a light on the activism of um, other women of color. Um, I think there are two things I'll say. The first is that among the women I write about in Vanguard, um, highlighting a couple of dozen women individually, but um, hoping that you see in their work um, the uh, the uh, images of really hundreds and thousands of other Black women activists. Um, the women I write about, some of them are admiring of Stanton and Anthony, um, admiring um, their ideas, um, admiring their uh, tenacity and longevity, um, admiring of their organizational skills, um, and more. And um, even as Stan and Anthony um, and those who inherit their movement at the end of the 19th century, um, these are all figures who are um, too close to and too steeped in anti-Black racism to make them close allies and real comrades in the struggle for women's political power, um, there is a um, admiration for them um, that is expressed um, uh, and that is important to say. Um, I have allowed myself some feelings um, <laughs> this year, um, at least to this in this sense. Um, I'm not someone who thinks that the 19th Amendment is an occasion for outright or unqualified celebration. Um, that I do think that the movement's complicity with and trading in uh, anti-Black racism um, disqualifies the 19th Amendment and the activism that gets us there as the um, subject of a celebration. Now, the good news is for everybody who wants to celebrate, I'm only a historian and I don't organize celebrations. It doesn't really matter what I think. There are celebrations and 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 we, we can all differ about that. Um, so for me, the 19th Amendment is a landmark moment, certainly. It's important in the political lives of many Black women in the United States. Um, and yet, um, 
And while I am prepared to celebrate sort of the courage and tenacity of some of the women about whom I write, um, I'm not prepared to celebrate the 19th Amendment um, and to elide um, a great deal of its story, which is troubling. Uh, the, we're going to take two more questions. They're uh, they're both really good. So here's the first one. This is from Zach Phelps. Um, he asks, "Voter re voter access is still unbalanced racially. What can individuals do to combat this? And what further amendments should be pushed forth?" So I think this is partially speaking to the voter suppression that's now happening. So would either of you like to speak to that issue? I can jump in if if you want, Lisa. And I'll Please. Let you. Please. It me. Um, you know, one of the things that I think Lisa has already, um, Lisa Madison has already um, made plain, right, is that disenfranchisement um, in 1920 did not mean that Black women sat down um, and and waited uh, for enlightenment in Congress or anywhere else when it came to voting rights. Um, they learned politics, they practiced politics, they developed strategies and tactics that made them effective, um, despite disfranchisement, I think is really the way to think about um, the story that Lisa Matterson tells. Um, and so one lesson there, right, is that politics is a ground game in any given cycle. Um, and there, is, there are obstacles, um, formidable obstacles in, in 1920 um, and beyond. There are formidable obstacles in 2020. Um, and yet the work that black women do um, is, I write about women who organize suffrage schools and train one another how to pay a poll tax, how to pass a literacy test. Um, they turn out to the polls in numbers um, because they're safety in numbers in an era of lynching. Um, so uh, it's a reminder to me that um, while we should um, you know, vote and lobby and demonstrate and otherwise oppose voter suppression sort of at this level, um, part of our work is to be close to the ground and um, doing the work of um, getting people to the polls, um, even under conditions that are um, far from ideal, far from equitable. Um, I guess the other thing to say here um, is that um, the women I write about understand that politics is a long game, and um, and it is never is never done, uh, and it's certainly never done in any given election cycle. Um, and so they bequeath to us a kind of um, commitment and tenacity. Um, that means we think hard about voting rights, you know, when we benefit from something like a Voting Rights Act, and we think hard about voting rights and work hard on voting rights um, even after the Supreme Court um, guts the Voting Rights Act as it did in 2013. Um, and so this long game, I think for me, the lesson of Vanguard um, is that for most of the story I tell, um, Black women are in essence disenfranchised. Um, if not all of them, far too many of them. Um, and this doesn't mean that they um, are out of politics, um, that they are not able to vie for power. Um, and I think that we live with their legacy um, and we might appreciate what it means to take up um, sort of in their wake and to persist. Um, even as conditions are not what we would um, have them be. You know, um, you're really speaking to the final question too. So I want to read it out so that he, so that Spencer has the chance to have the question out there. It sometimes seems that we are going backwards when it comes to the right to vote. What can we learn from the woman you studied about fighting and keeping the right to vote? So maybe some final thoughts on, on the lessons that they have bequeathed to us. So uh, I'll jump in very quickly and say one of the big lessons that I learned is that, and it might seem kind of circular, but uh, voting is voting and being in the game is um, 
the way to push back against or to keep voting or to regain voting. And so to think about almost every angle uh, where it's possible to get a wedge. Uh, and I would also like to just add on and build on um, what Martha Jones said, and that is that um, I don't want to give the impression that the women that I write about in this book um, experienced a great deal of success in many ways. Many, I mean, they didn't get many of the things that they wanted and they kept going and they didn't stop. Um, and many of the things that they did fight for eventually did happen. Um, and so, um, it is indeed a long game. And I think that's one of the lessons that I, I mean, I write about what's called the nadir of black life in America. One of the lowest, historians talk about it as one of the lowest points. Um, and, um, you know, I think we're in another, uh, there's a, this is a nadir of it, of its own in this moment. And so I think about um, what it, what it meant to fight and not, I know that you might not see in your lifetime. Now I hope we will see in our lifetime. And so I'm not trying to be um, pessimistic, but just th they, they continue to fight even if they didn't know, even if they wouldn't necessarily see the results of their fight is a big lesson that I've taken from them. Professor Jones, did you want to add anything? Um, if I'd add anything, it would be, um, I think the lesson of history is that the story of voting rights in the United States is not one of progress and of ever expanding access to the polls at all. Um, the long story of voting rights or the ways in which Americans lose voting rights at the turn of the 19th century. Um, black men lose voting rights in the 1820s and 1830s. Um, women lose voting rights at the at close of the 19th and into the 20th century and so on. And so um, it is uh, perhaps um, humbling or disappointing to appreciate that this, our story of voting rights um, is one about expansion and contraction very much in response to political conditions um, driven by a structure that leaves to individual states still until today an extraordinary degree of latitude when it comes to determining who votes, by what means, when, and more. Um, so I'm someone who has advocated for a new federal amendment that would guarantee to every American the right to vote. Um, that might sound far-fetched, but it is in part an intervention that wants to underscore how far we live um, in this country from that sort of ideal. Um, no one in this country is guaranteed the vote. Many of us face the curtailment and suppression um, of our votes every day. Um, that is the American way up until at least this point in our history um, and I'll leave it to us uh, going forward to um, ponder whether we need to um, move fully into the 21st century by some other uh, by some other approach. Right. Yeah. I think at the end of your book, you say um, uh, the story of the vanguard is still being written. And Professor Madison, you say something very similar. You know that this is we're one link in the long chain of, of the battle. So. Sadly, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank you, Professor Madison and Professor jo Jones, for joining us today and for sharing this research. Your books reveal so much hard-won success and also remind us that there is so much to be done. Um, it was inspiring. And to all those listening in, make sure to go out and get a copy of their books. Um, I do have a couple of announcements before we sign off. There is a book signing right after this panel. The Zoom link is in the comments section on Facebook Live and on YouTube, so please join us for that. There is also a post-panel discussion at 2.30 p.m., and you can register for that at roosevelt.edu slash American Dream. And finally, we encourage you all to tune in to our next American Dream Reconsidered presentation, which is tonight. Uh, Tuesday night at 6 p.m. The presentation is 75 Years of Social Justice, the History of Roosevelt University, and it is with Lynn Weiner, Professor Emerita of History at Roosevelt University. Again, thank you all for listening in. Thank you, Professor Madison, Professor Jones, 
Thank you. Take care and stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.